<laughs> we're 12 minutes in and uh, we're talking about agency and I apologise for not recording this earlier. This recording will be available later on. And so agency is lost where the board of directors right around my gut cannot choose my life because the belonging committee is flat out trying to get belonging. And as Gabor Mate says, the brilliant uh, psychotherapist says, if we're left with these two needs to safely, safe attachment and authentic expression or agency or autonomy, I have to give up one or the other. Now, the one that I'm going to give up in a distressing family environment is always going to be agency because it's the thing I've got. It's the thing I can give up. What I give up is my power to choose my life so that my safe attachment, or at least not safe, but attachment now at any cost is not gone because a child cannot lose their primary caregiver or care caregivers. They must maintain them. And they believe it's their job now. Now, think of the ways in which somebody gives up that belonging. I'll come back to the F words in a moment. They roll over and play dead and become the parent way, way too early. And what happens in their 30s is they become parents and they're overwhelmed with the responsibility, not because an adult finds being a parent overwhelming, but because a five-year-old does and that five-year-old is still speaking through the unconscious and body of that parent in their 20s or 30s, and it becomes distressing and overwhelming. This becomes too much, and so their stress levels go up, their anxiety levels goes, go up, their depression becomes more manifest. There's the fight, the rage, the flight, the terror, the freeze, the hopelessness, the inability to make any decision, the flop, which is that despondency and despair, the fawn, as I said, the people pleasing. My job is to make everybody else okay. Maybe someone one day will make help me be okay because I have no power left. I've got no agency over myself. I've outsourced it. And the most terrible thing is, as I believe I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm bad. There's something seriously wrong with me. Now, why do I believe that? Do you know it's a piece of genius in a child, just like shame is genius in a child? I often say to clients, what does shame make you want to do? And they'll say it makes me want to be small, makes me want to hide. Well, think when shame first showed up. It got you out of harm's way. Shame was the survival tool. Janina Fisher, a trauma therapist, helped me understand many years ago that shame is a gift in the midst of trauma. And so being bad means I've got something I can do. I can be good or I can be better. I can try harder. I'll be good, a child says, when they're being hit by a parent, imploring that parent to stop hitting them because then if they could be better, then dad won't be angry, mum won't be angry. You can imagine what damage that does. And so there's a few other F words. Uh, feed. I end up going to drugs, alcohol, junk food, sugary food. I'm medicating my whole survival committee now, being on high alert because the belonging committee has said I don't. I'm a. I'm. I might be attached, but it's certainly not safe. The meaning making committee says I'm bad and everything's wrong with me. My agency is completely gone. The board of directors have basically walked out of the boardroom and said, "Sorry, we can't run this." We'll give it over to the committees. <laughs> and anyone knows anything rung by a committee is going to be mayhem. Um, and then there's, there's uh, the F word, fuck, which is where people rush to sexual addictions, which is simply no different to a tree that drops its seeds just before it dies because it must reproduce before it dies. It's a, a, a reptilian or a, a, a sheer biological imperative to, to, to survive. And if you're not going to survive, then you must reproduce before you die. And so you think of the sexual addictions that exist. So all of these F words, and then there's yet one more 
and that's flock. And flock is in the final nail in the coffin in the proof that agency is all at sea. And flock is I get into toxic relationships with people who will treat me badly, whether it's a gang or a cult or just a, 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 an intimate relationship or even the friends who will treat me badly. Because I belong. I remember a story, and this is very vulnerable of me, but I was in grade nine, I think, grade eight maybe, and my friends decided they thought it would be sport to take everything out of my school bag and spread it around the schoolyard and hide it. And so when all the buses came and took everyone home, I was still there as it was gathering twilight, trying to find my pencil case, trying to find textbooks and exercise books and pens and pencils. They thought it was hilarious. And I allowed it to happen. Why? Because they were my friends, or so I thought. They'd hang out with me, but not laugh with me, laugh at me. In other words, I became sport. And you can imagine the amount of work that I've done in the last 45, 50, 60, 65 years to discover and find again my agency, my sense of self. You can also imagine how terrifying it is for a client to walk in your room and say, help, I don't like who I am or I don't like who I live with or I don't like life at all. I'm not in control. I'm not coping. Something's wrong with me. I don't know what I, why I keep making the sum, same dumb mistakes. Now, I argue that Agency is the foundation of trauma therapy. A little bit about me, and you may have heard this story, but if you haven't, it's worth me repeating it. In 2019, I was in group supervision, and one of the other practitioners who I had lectured at college, who's much younger than me, was talking about client outcomes that I found to be simply impossible to believe. And I dismissed it out of hand and thought he was grandstanding and got quite angry. And I went to my supervisor one-on-one -on -one and I said to my supervisor, I don't like what this therapist is saying in supervision about his client outcomes. He claims it's the modality, the approach, but I know it's the quality of the relationship that the client has with the therapist. It's not the approach that matters. All the research tells us that. And I still believe that to be true with one caveat, which I'll come to in a little while. And uh, my supervisor wisely said, well, perhaps you need to make some investigations about this therapy. And reluctantly, I did. And I was still very sceptical. But it was, as I've often said, a little bit like that scene in the movie when Harry met Sally where the woman at another table after watching uh, a fake orgasm says, I'll have what she's having. I decided I wanted to at least discover it. I Actually, I think part of me wanted to prove him wrong. Uh, and the rest is history. I have uh, can't share publicly yet because the research is uh, still being analysed, but I was... Uh, an instrumental part of a research project that's just concluded with the University of Melbourne, where 20 consecutive consenting adult clients who met the criteria of the project, which included elevated PCL5 and DAS21 or DAS42 scores, who consented to being part of the project. Well, the research is very, very encouraging. Just yesterday, I concluded TRTP with a client three sessions over a three-week period where their depression score on the DAS 21 was 21 out of 21 when we started, which is as high as it goes, 17 out of 21 for stress, 12 out of 21 for anxiety, all in the extremely severe range. And it is now three, zero, and four, all in the normal range. There is no significant anything she said, more importantly, I like, honour and regard who I am. A, a client said to me yesterday something profound, which has stayed with me and will stay with me for years. She said that safe attachment is hard work for a parent. 
and it requires the parent to be regulated. Gabor Mate says no parent sets out to traumatize their child, but if they themselves don't know that they've got trauma, not PTSD, but something more central, more intrinsic, more terrible in one way than PTSD is not knowing who you are, not experiencing who you are. The Gabor Mate says that that th those people will not be able to give to their children what those children most desperately need. And you'll see these clients come into your room desperate for help. Well, this woman, she had had a violent and abusive father her whole life, a father who'd ridiculed and mocked her and taken away her agency. She was a perfectionist. That's a sign of a loss of agency because you don't know how much is enough, so you keep trying harder and harder and harder. She was stressed to the eyeballs. She had a terrible inner critic, criticizing everything she did. Once she regained agency, then she could do the work of trauma therapy, which then she could experience not just herself, but her younger self was safe. So as I said earlier, attachment, secure attachment is hard work on the part of the parent. But if the parent doesn't give it, it's still hard work. But it's now hard work for the child when they get older. Why is it hard work? Well, because as adults, we need to securely attach that child back to us. Because no one else can. No one else can. We are responsible for our own lives. We are responsible for our own lives. One of the first things I say to clients because who was, who was responsible for you to get well? They look at me pleadingly saying, you, I hope, I'm giving you money and time. You've got all the expertise. I've got all the, I've got all the tools, but I can't choose it. I can't choose it. So it's never hard work, and I mean this, never hard work for the child. And the moment that it is, then agency is lost in the child. So if the agency is lost in the child, it needs, needs to be refound in the adult. And once it's refound in the adult, then the adult can then provide secure attachment to their younger self. Not as a theory, not as a comprehension, but as a rich, visceral, embodied experience, as a full, intimate encounter in the most spiritually wonderful and meaningful way. And when you see that happen in the room, you know that the work is done. So the hard work has to be done. Now, here's the irony. Here's the irony. The hard work has to be done by the client with the therapist, but it doesn't have to be hard work. When I go to things like uh, somatic therapy, it's slow work. I go to CBT or cognitive therapies, and it is hard work because you get the meaning-making committee to run the whole thing. The meaning-making committee keeps on referring back to the other committees, and the board of directors aren't there. They go back to the survival committee, and the survival committee are going, we don't know. We don't feel safe, so can you come up with another idea? And the belonging committee, well, it's also not safe. And so you're asking the meeting-making committee to run everything, and it can't. Or you go towards the belonging committee where you have this uh, very Carl Rogers approach which is I completely support. It's the unconditional positive regard. It's the empathy. It's the congruence that we offer our clients. Why? Because it scaffolds what's missing in the, mean, in, in the belonging committee. But you know what happens then? The client then feels so safe, so secure, so seen and heard, so known by the therapist 
But one of two things happen. One is they see a psychologist and they've got Medicare funded 10 clients in Australia anyway, and then the funding runs out and then they feel abandoned all over again. Or if they are wealthy enough, they get to come to the client, yep, come to the therapist's rooms or sessions every few weeks. And I've heard this where clients have said to me, my hour in your room is the best hour of my fortnight or the best hour of my week. I feel safe, validated, seen and heard. But you know what happens? I go outside your room and it starts up again. I'll get in my car and before I even start the engine, there's an angry text from someone. And I want to come back to your room straight away. So with the best intentions, person-centered therapy will work with the belonging committee. But what it won't do is put the board of directors back into the boardroom so they can run this. What TRTP does at the outset is put the board of directors back into the boardroom and empower them to make decisions. What it then does wonderfully is it speaks directly to the meaning-making committee and tells it what the truth is. It's as simple as this, and it sounds ridiculous. I choose to know I am good. I am enough. I don't have to be anything other than who I am. And when the board of directors does that as an experience, the meeting-making committee goes, okay. And, and it's weird how quickly that happens. And as a result of a process the TRTP does in the beginning, the meeting-making committee quickly fall into line. Now, here's the irony is this, we don't actually go directly to the meaning-making committee. We go to the survival committee, who are exhausted. The survival committee are actually the smartest and oldest committee in our lives. It's ancient and automatic. They run 50 million things a second, every electrical impulse, every chemical re reaction. Right now, in your bodies, my bodies, heart rate, blood pressure, immune system, digestion, respiration, growing new cells. It's incredible. But when you ask the survival committee to run the whole show, the whole shebang, which it does as best it can, then it starts stuffing up other things. So I'll get clients with psoriasis, IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, um, lupus, migraines diabetes, most especially things that are autoimmune related, um, celiac disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. And to my absolute astonishment, these diseases go away when the board of directors are back in the boardroom. Because now at last, the board of directors tells the survival committee, guess what? It's all good now. We're, we're fine. You can just get on running the biology. You're good at that. In fact, you're incredible at that. And that's the only thing you have to do now. Because you know that the belonging committee are safe. Now, that's a lot of what we do in session two, but we start it in session one. Now, it sounds, if it sounds, if it doesn't sound too good to be true, then I really wonder what because it sounded too good to be true for me, that it could be that simple. But it is. And I cannot persuade a client. The one thing I won't do, a client said to me this week, who's booked in to do TRTP with me, and they've got a lot of trauma. And they said to me, uh, in a message, I'm going to have to reschedule or cancel our appointments. I'm not ready. And that's okay. I said, I honor that. I don't know that this will work for me. And you know, I can't change that. I cannot change that. And I'm not interested in changing it. Why? Because I am never going to be their board of directors. 
I'll be my own board of directors. And something happens when a client comes into your room and they know that the, that the therapist has their own board of directors in control of the whole show. Guess what? That board of directors, just for a little while, will say, it will lead me to say things like, I've got you and you're safe now. Just notice the power of those words in your own body. I've got you and you're safe now. And good things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. We're going in a wonderful place together. I'm not pushing you out there and telling you to do it on your own. I'm coming with you. But you know what? You have to take my hand, metaphorically, and we'll get there. Oh, we're going to get there and beyond. So I said we go in the reverse direction. We go with the survival committee's experience of everything being a disaster. Of the board of directors left the room. There's no one at the board table. And what I do is I take them into the chaos of their meaning-making committee, their belonging committee, and their survival committee. And I say, look at this mayhem. And I say, I say what would you do? What would you do to have everything the way you always longed it to be? Now, here's a thing. There's a, a therapy called narrative therapy. And narrative therapy has within it a thing called absent but implicit. In other words, there's something implicitly true within a, a person, even if they've never known it. It's a little bit like saying, I know I love chocolate, even though I've never tasted it. Of course, it doesn't take long to love chocolate. I have never met a person, and I mean, and I've met, Thousands and thousands of people. I've never met a person who, if they had the power to choose, would choose to be shut down, to be distressed, to be overwhelmed, to be chaotic. I've never, never, never met a human being who wants to feel powerless. In other words, every human wants agency. And Gabor Mate says it's the thing that is lost in so many childhoods. As I said, 73% of adults walking around have lost some sense of agency. You think of how advertising preys on it. If you, Ozempic, if I inject this into my body, then I'm going to be loved. I'm going to have a belonging committee. In other words, I'm not enough. I have to be a certain shape to be enough, body dysmorphia. And so it goes on, the ways in which, or the, or the man who says, I've got to stick steroids into my body to be enough, or whatever it is, whatever nonsense that distracts us. I've got to buy this car. I've got to get this degree. I've got to land this job. I've got to own this car house. I've, I've got to have this, whatever it is. I outsource my agency to advertising agencies they become my agency or to anything when i go with the reverse flow i am so so over feeling powerless i'm so over waking up in the morning dreading the day wondering how i'm even going to get through it i don't want to do this anymore you know something will happen at that point tears longing yearning, the grief of an unlived life. There are two key griefs in our lives. One is where something good or someone kind has left us because they died or we moved city or they moved city. That's a grief. That's the easier grief. The hardest grief is where something never happened that should have. The grief of never having what was ours. And so tears will flow. Sometimes anger. I'll watch a client get angry. And do you know what? At that moment, something profound happens within them. When I keep guiding them into who they actually are and always were, and they experience that, lights go off. They might start laughing. 
weirdly. This is ridiculous. It's that easy? They feel empowered. They feel 10 feet tall. I'll even get them to embody what that looks like. They are then ready to dive in. They are, it's kind of, get out of my way. I'm about to show up. And when I show up, I'm going to show up in every aspect of my life and I'm going to fly. <clears throat> now, to know that there is a therapy that can do all of that in the space of less than a month is pretty darn wonderful. And that has been my ongoing experience now having taken over 300 people through TRTP. I, 92% of the time, I see an extraordinary outcome. And I can predict when I'm not going to get an extraordinary outcome. And I tell my clients in advance, and so much of it revolves around agency. Sometimes I'll say to clients, do not tell me what you think I want to hear. You can't impress me. Tell me the unvarnished truth. I only want to know what's happening for you. You can't disappoint me. You can't impress me. I'm simply taking you where you want to go. So here's the, the basic ground rules that I found for agency. The first one is it must be embodied. It must take the whole person through somatic movement. It must. In other words, all the agency, sorry, all the committees need to agree with one another and the board of directors need to take over the show. That has to happen. If a therapy does not involve the entire embodied experience of a human being, it simply won't work. It'll vaporize within hours or days of leaving the therapy space. The second is it must be authentic. In other words, it must line up with the reality of the client's experience of reality. It must address the unconscious barriers that people have. I told you already about I'm not enough, I'm bad, there's something wrong with me, but there are a lot of others. I deserve to be punished. I deserve to suffer. I'm a piece of garbage. I have to keep everybody else happy to be safe. Notice all of those. All of those barriers must be addressed at the level of the unconscious. It must have emotional resonance with the client. It has to give the client a powerful sense of their specific pain that's held them back. And to challenge the right for that specific pain to keep them stuck there. One of the beautiful things I love about TRTP, in fact, one of the most elegant things is the homework we give clients. When that homework comes back, it's a blueprint and so often I'll have clients say, how did you know me from the inside out? You're using words I use. It's only because they've given me their words. And the training is so elegant, so wonderful in the sense that in the training, you learn how to use that homework to learn what the patterns are so that you can have that emotional resonance with the client. So the client experiences their own truth. And the beauty is, is that unlike talk therapy where the client's going to have to richly reenact often their trauma by telling their story over and over to client therapist after therapist. With TRTP, we only need very short responses. That's why it doesn't take months or years, why it only takes a short amount of time. The homework and the whole process makes it so elegant that it's all done very quickly. And finally, so I'll go through it again, it must be embodied. It must take the whole person through this pro through this process. It must be authentic. It must identify um, the barriers that the client has and move those barriers out of the way so they don't sabotage everything because they will if you don't. It must have emotional resonance with the client. It must have a connection to their lived pain, which becomes a tether to what pushed those board of directors out of the room and how do I, how dare anybody push those board of directors out of the room? They're coming back in. They're going to take over. I get to choose. No one else gets to choose. This is my life. And finally, 
it must be grounded in the client's actual experience of reality. It must have a directed, empowered sense. We, we as practitioners create the space, the energy, the environment for this to happen. We get them into our rhythm and it's quite directive in that way, but it doesn't require me to be exhausted. I don't have to fake it. In fact, if I faked it, it wouldn't work. It creates the energy within me that I can create it for my clients. Now, you don't have to train in, you don't have to do TRTP yourself to train in TRTP, though I would strongly encourage it always only because you experience the power of it. In fact, I'd, ex I'd recommend people experience it regardless. I'd argue the first session of TRTP, even if you've never had trauma, is something that every human could, should experience. When those four conditions are met, the client then has agency. They then have an experience, a lived experience of who they actually are. And only then are they ready to begin to process their trauma. Then they can stand up to any threat and nothing. They're, they're unshakable and immovable now. They can crash in through and out of any trauma safely without even being singed by it without even any smoke on them. They've, they've, they've got their superpower. In fact, I even use those words. It is a superpower, being able to choose at, in any environment, in any time, in any situation. I get to choose nobody else, just me. It's my life. I'm not giving that choice up ever again. When that's true, and only when that's true, Trauma's done and dusted. It will be. That's the second session of TRTP, which we don't go to. So we don't go anywhere near their distressing events. So there's apart from filling out the homework, which can be a little challenging because you've got to talk about some things, but only in dot points. Clients then have to uh, explore it just for a little bit. But by the time they get to session two, we haven't even looked at their trauma. And they're raring to go, even though they know we're going to look at it because they've got their sense of self. Now, I open this space up to any questions, any comments, anything that you want to bring, any observations that you've got. And you can uh, text them. And while you're texting them, um, just a very brief message that I wanted to share uh, the next training is starting on the 21st of June, so it's just under a month away, and there are some great discounts available. Uh, to find out about the training, we'll send you, TRTP will send you an email in about an hour with a link to book a one-on-one -on -one q and uh, And can I encourage you to consider that? What happens if a client doesn't disclose their trauma or know about it? That's a very good question. If they don't disclose their trauma, as happened recently to me, a client had been sexually abused by somebody as a child, and I took them through the first two sessions, and something wasn't shifted, shifting. Now, this client had experienced trauma as a sexual trauma as a child, and as you would know, anyone who's experienced sexual trauma often won't talk about it for decades. I experienced it at 12, didn't mention it to a soul till I was 50. Now he said, well, there's something I'm so ashamed of. I carry so much self-blame and guilt about. Uh, and of course, he was a victim of someone twice his age who took advantage of him. And so there's a trauma that was disclosed. Now, why was it disclosed? It's because... After the two sessions, something wasn't working. It seemed the traumas we dealt with had dealt with everything. But he'd become more distressed. Now, I'll tell you this. TRTP works. But if a client doesn't tell you something, well, you can't know about it, can you? 
but I know, and again, the, the process will take you through, you'll know something's not right. And this is what you'll end up saying. Is there something you've never felt safe enough to tell anybody, but you know that you just need to tell somebody? And out it comes. And then we dealt with it. And the freedom, the liberty that comes out of that is extraordinary. The second thing is this. Traumas can stay hidden under traumas. So once you deal with a trauma, the one that's obvious, one that was repressed suddenly emerges. It's kind of like if you've got a, a, a flesh wound and you go to the hospital and they treat the flesh wound, but in the process they discover with an X-ray that the bone underneath was broken. The underlying trauma will reveal itself when the trauma that's more obvious is dealt with. I've seen this happen over and over. So sometimes a trauma reveals itself only when another trauma is out of the way. Now, we can only ever work with what is revealed. And you will find that TRTP creates a clear landscape. And so what? where are traumas stuck? Well, they're stuck usually in the survival committee. They know about them. They tell the truth about them. They just don't have the language that the meaning-making committee can make sense of. Once the two committees start talking through the board of directors, there's awareness, there's understanding, there's insight. <clears throat> you think about what repression is. Is the survival committee saying, we're not letting the meeting-making committee know anything about this because it would be too distressing. So we're going to lock it away in the body, in the unconscious. And so once the survival committee knows it's safe, and once the meaning-making committee makes sense of life, well, guess what? Those traumas will emerge. It's, it's a simple analogy, these committees and the board of directors, but I've lent into it just recently more and more, and uh, I've discovered it's... Uh, I, I sometimes, I, I once described it like this. It's uh, imagine a uh, five, six, seven-year-old child uh, behind the steering wheel of a car and the engine is the unconscious beliefs, the meaning-making committee pulling the car off in diff different directions and the headlights are the conscious mind which can only see what's straight right in front and the child is trying to drive this car, trying to steer the car. Well, that's what's lost. That's the agency. I have no power to drive this thing. I don't know how to. How do, do, do we do I work or do we work with generational trauma? We do. There's a there's a component within TRTP that beautifully addresses generational trauma. And it usually deals with generational trauma once all the personal traumas, the experienced traumas in this life are dealt with, then we can deal with generational trauma. And often you can see the connection between the two. Ash, you raised your hand. If you send a message through the webinar chat, I'll be able to answer that. I can't answer it any other way. And uh, yes, this video will be accessible afterwards to watch over and over if you'd like to. I've, if, I've written a white paper on this also, which is available somewhere. Um, but uh, I, I love talking about this, as you can probably tell, because I have discovered that there's a lot of trauma-informed therapy. And I've read Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk and Babette Rothschild, and I love their work. But it's only when I've come in contact with a trauma transforming process, not a trauma informed process, but a trauma transforming process that have become so committed to it. And the irony, of course, is that while I might work for many more years, I'm in my mid 60s and it's, uh, I, I was nearing retirement at 60, at, at 59. I thought, I think, and here's the funny thing about agency that one thing I haven't talked about is our agency as practitioners. We, my old supervisor used to say to me over and over, Richard, never 
forget your own impotence when it comes to being able to change your clients' lives. They've got to choose them, not you. Now, I've talked about that already. But you would know if you've been working as a therapist for many years, as a practitioner, that it can become exhausting and even a bit dispiriting when you see the state of the world, the levels of trauma that are existing in our society at every level and how humans seem to reproduce trauma and seem to create trauma. What's going on in the Middle East and Europe, it's like it's always somewhere happening. The political discourse, social media, in so many, and the planet itself. And so this becomes so overwhelming as therapists when we see clients come and go and we're not sure and often they will stop coming either because they ran out of money or they lost hope that anything would happen or they found a better fit with another therapist or they might have got well or, you know, they just got on with life. You know, one of the wonderful things about TRTP is we have celebrations because I see in the space of a month the client get completely well. I mean, completely well. I've had them skip out my door. I've given, they've given me a hug and they said, you've given me back my life. And I said, no, no, you gave yourself back your life. I just took you there. I'll go out my, my door. Now I'll follow up with them a month later and they're always doing great, almost always doing great. But you know how much, it's kind of like I get a dopamine hit from that. It's the best addiction you could ever have. I get a dopamine hit because I get closure, which we rarely get as therapists. I never got it before TRTP, unless I was doing maybe pre-marriage or those extraordinary couples therapy sessions where the, where, the, uh, where the fragmented couple suddenly resolve something in the room and it's wonderful to see. I saw that. But by and large, week in, week out, year in, year out, I was reaching retirement. My own agency in the therapy space was not something that I would have said, my goodness, this is the most wonderful thing to do. And now I can. So it's not just that our clients get agency. We as therapists through TRTP have enormous agency. And it's the most rewarding thing. And it's really why I'm still working. Uh, I said to Judith Richards, Judith, you've created a terrible problem here that you haven't realized. And she said, what's that? I said, well, I, I'm booked up about three, four weeks out. This was going back about six years ago. And if my clients all get well in the space of three sessions, I won't have any clients. She burst out laughing and she said, have you read the news? Have you listened to the news? Well, I've pretty much closed my books for the rest of this year. And I pick and choose clients nowadays. If I don't want to work with a client because it's not a good fit or it's not going to work with my schedule, I'm taking 11 weeks leave this year. It's funny to say the agency it's given me in my own life. And other therapists say the same thing. That I woke up yesterday morning and by lunchtime, I had seen a client go from suicidally depressed to completely free of depression. That had happened. And I woke up in the morning knowing they were coming for their third session. And I knew that they had ownership of their life. I knew this was going to happen. So welcome. Thank you, everyone who's attended this webinar and for anyone who's watching it later on. And uh, I would strongly encourage you if you haven't already, to seriously consider if you want to experience that kind of outcome with your clients that I've just described. This is not a sales bill. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because our world is in too much darkness and pain. And I've got grandchildren and they're getting loved wonderfully by, their children, by, the, by my children, by their parents. But I would want every child to experience this, and they won't if their parents don't experience it. The world won't experience it as if we don't change it one person at a time.
And uh, thank you, Tony. And uh, hopefully, uh, Marg will get you the details. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being part of this. And uh, appreciate your time and your energy. This is wonderful work. And uh, may you go well with whatever work you're doing. May you see the kinds of results that make your work satisfying and rewarding. May your clients flourish and thrive in life. Take care, everybody. Um, anyone who wants to get my paper can message me directly. Um, if you look for Richard Fay Counseling on Facebook, you'll find me. Send me a message there and I will get the paper to you.